Okay, I'm on. You're on. Okay. Super. Yeah. Thank you one and all for joining us. I wish we could just do this in a big room, but I think uh, being able to do it like this allows folks from all over the place to join in. So um, thank you for doing this. As I think most of you probably know at this point, this is the second in a four part series of online workshops we're doing for artists. This one is going to be all about contracts. Um, and so uh, as I think some attorney friends have, have told me, it's uh, sort of the, the fascinating exhaustion of clauses. And I don't mean Santa, uh, you know, Santa Claus, it's clauses and a lot of writing. And Katie has done a great job of sort of breaking down the typical city contract. And as she mentioned, uh, these will be recorded. And so you can go back to them, refer to them as an online resource in the weeks and months to come. And also, frankly, if there are friends of yours, who have not been weren't able to make today's, it's going to be up there on the web for them to, to check in on. So please share that information. As I mentioned, this is the second. The first one was about applications and the selection process for public art projects at the city of Phoenix. Um, the third one is going to be about um, design and how you develop designs. Uh, solo and also in design teams. And the, there's going to be a fascinating presentation that Katie can walk through about a project that's in motion right now as part of the, the new SkyTrain uh, out at uh, the 24th Street Station. And then on the 27th, that's going to be on the 20th, and then on the 27th, we're going to have an overview of construction and fabrication and how that rolls in a lot of public art projects. And so we hope you'll tune in for those. Uh, you may already know that to register for these classes, just go to phoenix.gov slash arts and there's a big emblem on there and you can log in through an Eventbrite and um, Katie can go into that a little bit more. The one caveat about contracts is that we're not here to offer you any kind of legal advice. We obviously can't do that. All we can do is describe all of the key elements that are part of our contracts and stick with us because contracts can have their own fascinating boredom at times. Those of us who are project managers and have to write them, please empathize with us as you walk through these. Um, and then at the end, you know, shoot your questions along in the chat box. Barry will track those. And then when we get done with the presentation, we can go to those. And if you have complicated questions, obviously we can turn on your mics and chat that way. But thank you again. The Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture is delighted to be able to present these. As you can see on your screen, my name's Ed Lebo and I uh, direct the public art. So welcome, and Katie, take it away. You want to reinvent the wheel. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Stegall, or Catherine Stegall is what my email would have said to you this morning for the login info. Um, we're going to get started on the presentation now. I'm going to ask if you could please mute yourself either on your phone or on your computer um, and that will help with any feedback issues um, in the recording that we're going to eventually post online um, to the office of arts and culture's youtube page um, i want to introduce a couple other folks from the office of arts and culture ed lebo is our director he just gave our introduction um, barry sparkman is here Wave Barry. Um, he is going to be collecting all of the comments and questions in the comment box as we go through the presentation. So please do not hesitate to type a question in that box and we will do that at the Q&A in the end. Um, yeah, so we're moving on now from last week's session where we talked about selection process and applications. The contract is our next phase. This is what happens after you are selected for a public art project and you are put under contract through the city of Phoenix. Um, it can sometimes be an, um, an intimidating process because it's a very thick document um, full of lots of clauses, but we're gonna help try to walk through this process with you and explain the outline of the contract and what everything um, can mean to you as an artist. Uh, but as Ed said, um, we are not lawyers or legal experts. Um, so none of this should be considered legal advice. 
if you are interested in advice um, or a workshop with a legal professional um, who specializes in public art or in the arts, let us know in that chat box. It might be something that we can work on for a future workshop where we actually bring in um, an arts lawyer um, to do a more in-depth workshop with some legal um, advice. Um, but right now we're just going to kind of walk through it and let you know what what all these clauses and this giant document um, means for an artist beginning a public art project. Um, so the type of contracts we're going to walk through today um, are contracts for a site-specific commission public art project, usually a permanent public art project. Typically for the site-specific design commission projects, you're going to have two separate contracts to make that project happen. You're going to have a design contract and a fabrication contract separately. Rarely, but on occasion, we will have a contract that has both phases together. It may be um, the case that we do that if a project is like super fast tracked and we know we're not going to have time to do a contract in the, in the interim portions between design and fabrication. But most of the time we have them separated into design and fabrication. Um, a design contract is going to cover everything that it takes to get a project ready to build. Um, but doesn't actually build it. It's going to cover your design concept, your research, your community meetings that you have in order to prepare yourself for the project, um, meetings, travel, um, any materials that you have to need for proposals um, to project teams, et cetera, and if you have to subcontract an engineer. Um, Ed, do you want to tell us a little bit about this photograph and why we chose it um, to go with this illustration of a design contract? Sure, this is a great example, actually, of what happens in a design team meeting. That's the artist, artist Jody Pinto there in the foreground holding a, an example of a bridge and the table around which a good deal of work was done to develop a new pedestrian bridge, which is out on the Loop 202 right at about Elwood on the west side of Phoenix. It's a sensational bridge, not quite, quite open yet. Construction is just about done, but you can certainly pass under it as you drive along the Loop 202. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that in the future, but it's a wonderful bridge that Jody has designed. All right. And now this is what a fabrication contract usually covers. Um, if this is an artist who is building the project themselves, that fabrication contract is going to cover all of the cost and the details for the materials and labor for that artist to build the project. If in the other case, it's the artist who is um, actually paying a subcontractor or working with um, a city contractor to build the project, then their fabrication contract is going to cover the cost to pay their subcontractors, plus it's going to pay that artist for any oversight for that installation of, the, of contractors. So even if you as the artist have just been selected to design a project and then the building is being passed on to someone else, any sort of oversight is what is going to fall into your fabrication contract. And Ed, we want to talk about the photo here. It's the same sure, project. I mean, sure, I mentioned uh, Jody's work uh, with the design team on the, the bridge in the west side. Um, in almost every case where you have a major project, there's a prototype that gets done ahead of time so that everybody can approve all of the details. And this was a walkthrough of a prototype that Magnum Companies on the west side of Phoenix produced before the bridge even began construction. And so you can see all of the perforated panels and all of the structure that would be typical of each segment or module of the bridge as it was put together. So this would be something that if you're an artist on a project, uh, you would expect to be involved in. Uh, and that's certainly part of something that would be in a design or a construction uh, project document. So when I emailed out your um, login information today, I did include a template of a design contract, and we're going to walk through that in a minute. I didn't include a template of a fabrication contract yet, but if that's something that you're interested in, um, we can definitely share that as well. Um, 
I, you just send me a note, send me an email note, and we can we can share that out with all the participants today. Okay, so contracts are a complicated process, but the most important thing to remember here is don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, your project manager is here to help you understand this process and walk through the process. Um, and we also want you to remember that the contract is there to protect you just as much as it is there to protect um, the public. Um, and there are three areas that we want you to make sure to pay close attention to when reading a signing uh, contract, um, insurance, copyright, and liability and warranties. Um, we're going to do a fun little game for a minute, and then I will walk into an actual contract, and I will actually step through each of these in more detail as well. Um, but let's play a little game first, just to be a little interactive. Um, you are all muted, so um, you'll have to unmute yourself before you can answer this question. I'm going to put up a little paragraph from one of our typical contracts, and let's see if we can identify together which topic it relates to. So, except in the event of a termination of this agreement by the city or as otherwise provided below, the artist retains all rights to any work products, including rendering model, blah, blah, blah. You all can read that for yourselves. Um, but does anybody know which section of the contract this might pertain to? It's one of those three categories right there. Copyright? Yes, that is the copyright section. Um, it's a much bigger section overall. Um, and I will walk through each step of, of what that means um, when we get to looking at the sample contract. Let's just do one more. This one's a little tricky. Insurance. Yes. <laughs> I know this is a silly game. Um, this one's a little confusing because it actually uses, oops, sorry, the terminology of liability. But this is actually from the insurance section of the contract, which is a huge section of the contract. Um, and I have some tips on how to handle that section as an artist um, rather than trying to understand it all yourself. So we'll, we'll get to that right now. I'm going to walk through a sample. So let me bear with me just a minute while I pull up my sample contract for us to walk through. Can I get a thumbs up from someone if you can see this contract? Okay, great, super. Um, so this is the template contract that I sent you today. Um, the red markings in it are kind of the things that are um, customized each time you have a new project. So there's no actual artist name in here. Um, it's just a standard template. Um, and it's important that you know that these templates consist of two pieces, a boilerplate, which is what we'll walk through first. That's kind of the biggest chunk of it um, and a exhibit section. The boilerplate is what is given to us by the City of Phoenix um, um, Contracts Department and Legal Department. There's not much we can change about that. And it does get updated as city and state laws are updated and amended. So even though you have this template right now, if you were to actually be awarded a project and go through this process with us, next year or two years from now, it could be slightly different in the boilerplate depending on which state and local laws um, have been updated since then. But this is a good this is a good template for us to take a look at and understand kind of the layout of what a public art contract and kind of the basic main things that everything includes. So the first page of like the recitals in the agreement, this is going to be where kind of the very basic information, your name as an artist, um, or if you are registered as an LLC, you would include your name as the LLC in this contract. Um, the date that you um, were approved as the selected artist for the project would be included in here. That would come straight from our city council records. Um, and then the name and the address of the project that you're going to be working on. Um, 
And then it goes into a definition section, which just outlines typical definitions that will be continuous throughout the rest of the contract. Um, the city department is um, named and labeled there because your project is typically associated with the city department, either the water department, the public works department, depending on what the project is. Um, section two, the period of service, it's pretty straightforward. This is the amount of time that the contract is um, eligible for, and the expiration date of the contract will be included in there. Um, one thing I want to point out there is typically we as project managers will push that project date out farther than what we expect the project to be finished in, just in case there is a delay. That way we don't have to pause and amend the contract to continue work going if there is some sort of delay in the overall project because there are things that happen in projects that are out of our control um, they could be construction related they could be city department related they could be pandemic related um, and we want to be sure that we still have a valid contract for us to continue working on um, in the midst of those delays so oftentimes you will see that date being two, three years down the road or two, three years beyond what you expect your project to be completed. It's it's um, just a way for us to be able to keep moving despite any delays. I mean, fingers crossed you don't have delays, but sometimes that happens. Um, then you get into section three, which is the obligations of the artist. This is what's expected of you as a city, um, as a contractor to the city. Um, it is pretty standard. It doesn't usually lay out exactly the details of your specific project, but it states things like you're going to be expected to provide renderings or you're going to be expected to follow city laws. Um, it does kind of outline when you submit a proposal, you know, what is the process for the city reviewing it and providing um, feedback back to you. There actually are some day requirements that we have to provide feedback back to you um, when you provide us with items. Um, so it's important to read through all of those and understand the expectations of the artist. And then there's later on another section that outlines um, additional expectations of the city to the artist as well. Um, I highlighted this section 13 because um, this is something that we customize a little bit depending on each artist and project. Um, it outlines how many meetings you might be required to attend for a project, which is super important, especially if you're traveling for a project, if you have to fly in or drive in for these meetings. Um, we can make that a smaller number that you have to be available at physically in person, or we can include a tiny bit of language in there that says you'll be available either in person or digitally to participate in these meetings. Um, but it is specific to um, each project, how much community involvement um, is required. Artist representations and warranties. Um, this is basically the section where you say, okay, as the selected artist to the project, these are going to be my art, my design. I'm not going to sub out design or use designs from other artists um, on this project because I have been the artist who is selected. And then this section payments is, is pretty important too. Um, Again, this is boilerplate, so this kind of covers more generally what the payments are about. The details of each payment and what's required from you in each payment is going to be a specific um, exhibit. And I will show you an example of an exhibit a payment schedule um, at the end of this contract. They're usually attached at the back, um, but you'll have your 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 base amount of the contract included here. It explains that you'll be paid in milestones. Um, this is an important item to look at because it can change based on what the city is doing right now. Um, formerly, the city used to agree to make payments to artists within 30 days. Right now, everything is really sort of backed up in the city's payment system, so they have changed this item in the boilerplate contract to stay 45 days and 
that's a city payment system. There's not anything really we can do in the contract to change that as project managers. Um, sometimes we do kind of rush things if needed for a particular artist or project. Um, but typically the, the city will agree to pay you within 45 days of an approved invoice. Um, I'm sorry, my dog squirrel. Um, income taxes, this basically says you are, as um, this contractor, we will provide you with a 1099 form so that you can pay your taxes each year. Um, so all of your payments for each year will be recorded and sent to you at a 1099. Um, then we have a section on the city's responsibilities. This goes into a little bit more detail about what the city is required to do in terms of promptly um, reviewing your um, submittals, um, providing you with the information that you need to do the project. Um, so this outlines, you know, what I as a project manager um, communicate with you as an artist. Um, contract administration, you know, some of this is just, this is just outlining it's a arts and culture is going to be the administrator of the contract rather than the water department or someone else. Um, insurance. This big section six is a, is a big confusing section. It just, it's still confusing. Um, what I recommend artists do is to take this whole section from their contract, put it in a document and send it to your insurance provider and ask them, do I have what I need already covered? Like, am I already covered up to this limit? Um, if you're not, then they can provide the additional coverage, let you know how much it's going to cost each year. Um, and then typically your um, insurance provider will just provide the certificate of insurance that we need directly to us because all of this information is outlined in here. Um, and we have to have a certificate of insurance on file for you for each year that you are working on the project. Um, so all of that is outlined there, but that's typically what I recommend um, to the artists who are working with us is that you just take this whole section, send it to your insurance provider, um, have them break it down for you. Um, it, oftentimes, most of this is already covered in, in your normal general liability um, coverage that you already have, um, but sometimes a little bit of an increase to the um, limits are required. Um, termination, termination by the city or termination by the artist. This outlines um, what would be required um, for either party to cancel out or um, step away from the contract. We hope that all of this never happens. But if we do, again, this protects both you and um, the public. Um, interest in this contract. Then general provisions. This is a section of a bunch of different topics. Um, some of them I'm, I will skip over or I will say, if you have an attorney, you want to have your attorney look at each section, but I'm going to walk through a couple of them that are important to focus on. First thing is audit and records. Um, it's really important that you maintain records, not just for us to take a look at, but sometimes if you get audited by another party or a tax audit, to have those records for three years after the close of the project. That's a pretty standard requirement in most public art um, projects because I think it's typical of like city record keeping. Um, so you finish the project, you do your ribbon cutting, don't throw away all of those papers and plans and documents that you have. You want to keep those for three years after. And then after three years, um, feel free to let them go. Um, but it's it's important to hang on to them um, for a while afterwards. Communications that outlines how to contact your project manager, um, which we'll get very familiar with. Emails back and forth over the months or years that we're working on projects together. Ownership of documents is important to um, outline. Anything that's produced graphically, 
um, and submit it as a proposal, this becomes um, ownership of the city so that we can use it for non-commercial purposes. You know, if we have to go to meet with airport executives and give a presentation and we need to take your model with us, um, th that's why this becomes those pieces of any work related to the project becomes ownership of the city because we use them going forward as illustrations. Um, like I used, if you were on our last call, I used an example um, of Frank Gonzalez's um, painting that was his proposal that stepped through. That is because we have the ownership of that particular piece that's related to um, him finishing this project. Um, ownership and intellectual property rights. This is uh, one of those three key items that we were talking about in the presentation slides earlier. Um, this basically says that you are protected by the Visual Artists' Rights Act of 1990. Um, if you look at other city contracts from other cities or other places, you want to make sure that that contract um, says that you retain those rights because I have seen contracts in the past where they ask you to waive those rights and you don't want to do that. Um, this also outlines, you know, the fact you own the copyright to your work. Um, but the city does have the right to photograph, make slides, make postcards, reproductions of your work um, for non-commercial purposes. Um, that's so that we can promote and share your work with the public um, so that they can go out and see it in person um, and enjoy it. And Ed, you had a story about kind of the difference between our the city's non-commercial purposes and commercial purposes and, and what that looks like. Can you share that with us? Sure, be glad to. Uh, it's not uncommon for the city film office to receive requests from advertisers, let's say, companies that want to shoot commercials. Um, and sometimes they want public art in the background. So as a city, we can't give them permission to have your work in the background of their ad. They would have to reach out to you as the artist, that is the owner of the copyright, to get your permission and discuss whether you want any royalties related to that uh, with that company. That is really between you as an artist and whoever the company might be that wants to use your work as part of a branding opportunity. And that comes up, uh, well, not a lot, but it's it happens. And so that's where this clause is really important. We can't give that permission away. Um, that's for you to give away or sell or what have you. But we have rights, as Katie pointed out, as the city to advertise your work, celebrate it, uh, use it for educational purposes in a wide range of areas. So. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to move a little bit quicker so that we can get to the meat and potatoes of it, which is the exhibits. Um, but I do want to point out this removal and relocation section. Um, this is important for you to understand how your work is going to be treated and cared for going forward and what happens um, in the case that something changes or modifies your work and what your rights are as an artist to either disclaim or um, be involved. This outlines how we as the Office of Arts and Culture are going to get in touch with you as the artist. Um, you will have um, the opportunity to comment on repairs and restorations. Um, so this is an important clause to understand what happens after the project is done um, and it becomes um, a, a part of the city's collection. Um, I'm going to skip over indemnification. This is something that you would want to have um, your lawyer look over um, if needed. Delays or hindrances, we kind of talked about that a little bit, um, that sometimes there are delays that happen that are beyond our control because we actually follow the schedule of the overall projects being built. Um, whether it's a SkyTrain station, we follow 
that contractor and the airport's schedule for building that. Um, it's not just just dependent on the artists um, and the art and culture schedule as much as we'd love it to be. Um, we have to follow their schedule as well. Um, compliance with laws, we all have to follow federal, state, and local laws. Um, subcontracting, it's important to understand that if you do hire a subcontractor out during design, you might hire a subcontractor to do engineering for you, or you might hire a subcontractor to do some digital design work for you. We need to know about that. Um, and um, you just, you have to uh, agree to let us know about that. If you're hiring someone, um, you might need them to have the same sort of insurance requirements in the contract. And we can help you walk through those subcontracting questions because they're really specific to each project. Um, I, can, I can add something there, Katie, just very briefly. And it refers back to the insurance piece. If you're, if you're an artist building something that's going to be big and, uh, or hanging over the public in some way, you're going to want an engineer to look at the structure of it and produce structural drawings or civil drawings if it's related to any kind of electrical that's part of that. Artists can't get what's known as errors and omissions insurance. Now we're getting into the weeds a little bit, but what that means is that um, if you design a bridge and the bridge falls down, somebody's going to come after you as an artist or an engineer. That's not the kind of insurance that you can get as an artist, but all of the subcontractors you work with, whether they be engineers or architects, are licensed professionals and they can get that insurance. And so when that, that's why it's really important, as Katie mentioned, that if you're going to be hiring subcontractors to assist you in your design process, we need to know about them so that we can at least point out this is an important consideration as part of your insurance as well. So that's the reason that that's there. Thanks, Ed. Um, I'm actually going to skip through um, most of the rest of these, they're kind of straightforward and you do have this document to look through, um, but I want to make sure we have enough time for questions at the end. Um, following that whole boilerplate section is where you're going to have your signature page. Um, and then we begin our exhibits. These exhibits are really what um, is the meat and potatoes of what you're going to be required to do. I like to think of these sections as sort of like the recipe, what you do and in which order, what steps they are and what's required for each payment for you. Um, so it typically will outline each um, phase of design, project orientation, and then a bullet point list of exactly what needs to be provided for each specific um, layer of design. Um, it's built out to be quite comprehensive so that if changes have to be made between um, each of these sections, um, we have the opportunity to do so and get updated timelines or updated narratives or updated budgets. Um, when you submit each of these specific deliverables during design, they will be reviewed not only by us at the Office of Arts and Culture, but they'll be reviewed by the whole project team as well um, from the funding department for the project. Um, so it's important that we have all the details there and we have these different deliverables that are, um, that we have the time to adjust them in between each phase. Um, and then, of course, what's required for the 100% design phase is much more comprehensive. Next week um, in the workshop, I'm going to go through each of these phases and talk about the difference between what's required in 30% to 60% to 90%. Um, and then we also have another workshop coming up with artist Bill Dambrova, who I think might be on the call with us today, um, where he is actually going to walk through some of the more specific details of working with digital rendering. So we're getting ready to put that information out there about Bill's workshop. So keep in mind um, that that information is coming in the future. We'll, I think it's a series of four workshops that we're gonna do in September. Um, exhibit B is sort of a format layout um, for what you'll present 
for each submission um, and for the final design documentation. Again, it's really comprehensive um, about what we need at each level. But let's let's look at this payment schedule because this is actually where most of the negotiation for your contract kind of comes into play. This is where you kind of break down Okay, I'm going to need this much money to get started, and that's going to be your project orientation payment, your first payment. Um, and then we sort of break down 30, 60, 100 percent um, so that it it matches the amount of work that you're doing for each. Um, this is estimated to the best of our ability as you work through a project, sometimes things change a little bit and you might need to split a payment in half it's um not something that we encourage doing but if you've done you know half of the design work for the 30 percent design and you need to get some cash flow going so you can complete it call your project manager talk to us um, and we can work through those issues with you um, the other thing that i wanted to point out here is this contingency amount. Um, city contracts um, encourage us to have a contingency. It's typically 5 to 10 percent of the overall contract amount. Um, and that contingency is meant for um, unexpected things that come up outside of the contract. Um, they don't always come up, but pretty regularly there are unexpected um, contingency items that do come up. Um, or if we know that item is going to come up, we don't know how much it's going to cost. We might pad the contingency a little bit so that we know we have the cash flow available um, for those items. So payment schedule is really important. Work closely with your project manager. Try to estimate what you as the artist, um, what you think you're going to need at each phase. And we'll, we'll work with you to try to make that, um, make that work for you. Okay. If I could just add on the contingency piece, um, this is what's known as an owner's contingency. And that means that the city, you know, Katie, Barry, Elizabeth, Doug, or I would review your request for a payment or a cost that comes out of that contingency and see if it's a legitimate one for the project. And we say, A-OK, okay, let's go with that. Um, it's not money that automatically comes to you if there's any left over at the end of the project. Good example for that is the Terrazzo projects at the airport. We know that the artists have to get Terrazzo samples from the Terrazzo company, and sometimes that comes out of the contingency so the artists can pay the companies to produce those samples for them. And I'll leave it at that. Um, moving on, we typically do have an invoice layout um, attached to your contract. It is not required that you use this exact layout. If you already have an invoice template that you use, that's fine. You just have to make sure that it has the information on here needed. We will need your contract number and we'll need your, your city of Phoenix vendor number. Um, you will have to register as a vendor with the city of Phoenix. Usually by the time you've gotten to this contract phase, you're already registered as a vendor because you've been paid for your proposal, um, but sometimes you're not. Um, it is, uh, even if you're, you're not going into a contract with the city of Phoenix, I do recommend looking into that vendor registration process um, and registering as a small business. Ed can probably speak a little bit better to this. Um, there are some benefits to registering as a small business with the city of Phoenix. Ed, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, just briefly. I think every artist who's running their small business out of their studio can qualify for what's known as this SBE, Small Business Enterprise Program. And this is a program where, um, particularly with federally funded projects, uh, construction firms, design firms are often looking for specific trades and talents. And if you're a qualified small business enterprise, um, they can get additional points in their application process for, or their bid process for projects. So you should look into that. Again, look up the city's small business enterprise program. It requires a, a good deal of paperwork where you have to submit tax returns and those sorts of things to qualify. But I think all artists should look at that because you never know when a contractor is going to need the talents that you bring to the table. 
And looking back at our document here, this is the last part that I'm going to point out to you, and then we're going to go into questions. Um, this worker analysis spreadsheet we provide to you um, so that we can track the amount of workers from um, local and non-local workers who are working on the project. This is the way that we track a project's economic impact on our community um, and on the field of public art. So we do ask that you as an artist provide this. Um, so if you have, for example, a graphic designer that you're working with, um, you can talk to them at the beginning of the project and say, you know, the city's going to ask me to provide this. Do you have a way to track how many hours you're working on the project? Um, because that is something that we ask uh, the artists to provide at the end of their contract. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now because I want us to have at least these last 15 minutes for questions. Um, let me stop sharing my screen so I can pop over and look at comments and then we will come back to sharing screen if we need to um, again. All right, Barry, you want to <laughs> throw some questions out at us? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, there's really great questions, um, but the first is a comment from Shannon, who is very enthusiastic about having a seminar by an arts lawyer. Okay, we cool. Can, we, we, can, we can work on that. And I think we have some leads, uh, so thank you for that. Sure, and then her question is, what percentage of concepts go through design contract phase, but do not end up getting a fabrication contract? Or if you don't have a percentage, how often does that happen? I would say it's fairly unusual um, for the simple reason that when we begin a project, we're working with the community that wants it. We're working with a department that is funding it. And we have to feel fairly sure all the way through that what gets designed gets built. Occasionally, for whatever reason, projects get canceled down the road. Particularly, you know, I can bring up the, the recession of 2008-9. Very tough years for the city in 10, 11, 12, uh, particularly for capitally funded projects. And so there were a few projects that withered on the vine during those times. But by and large, the works that we hire you to design wind up going through to completion. It's a good question. Yes, it is. And the I next guess question. it could vary by experience, but in my experience, I've been doing this since 2009. And I think out of the approximately 30 to 35 artists I've worked with, there were maybe three or four that went through a design phase and didn't get carried out. So it's a pretty small percentage. That's from my personal project management experience. And the next question is from Danielle, and you may want to let her clarify this. How often are artists included on both design and fabrication contracts? Danielle, I'm gonna unmute you or unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, I'm pretty new to this, so I was just understanding that there are different contracts, that there is um, a design contract and a fabrication contract. And I was just curious if there's ever a time when um, artists are just included on a, on a design contract, but they're not included in a fabrication contract. And if I misunderstood that, then yeah, then no, also. no, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I'm happy to take it. And Katie, you want to add to to what I have to say, or Barry? Um, we want artists involved from the beginning to the end of projects. And so, let's say you design a floor at the airport. Okay, so you'll be involved with the design team to develop that design, work with the Terrazzo company and fabricators and then finish that design. It then gets handed off to a fabricator because you're not a terrazzo layer, let's say, and most artists aren't. It gets handed off to the terrazzo company. But we would have what's known as a construction oversight contract with the artists, and we would tie you in at key milestones to approve what is being fabricated. For instance, 
Almost all terrazzo includes metalwork of some kind. So we would want you on site with the fabricator to review that metalwork layout to make sure that it is exactly where you intended it. And sometimes things get moved around a little bit or uh, projects right, require adjustments in the field. We want to make sure that you're there for that. And I know that Bill Dambrovo, when he does his uh, presentations in September, can talk a little bit about what he went through with the Terrazzo projects at the rental car center. So almost always, and I can't think of any instance where this has not been the case, almost always artists are there from beginning to end and uh, are signing off on what others build if they are not fabricating, building, and installing them themselves. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, it does. I think I was just wanting a clear picture of how that how that process goes. Thanks. Yeah, we need you as the artist to make sure that we are, whoever's building it is fulfilling your concept. We want to make sure that you feel satisfied and happy with the design that you've created because it is yours and your name will be on it. Well, and also this gets back to that copyright bit is that, you know, we want to make sure that the design that you sign off on is built to the integrity that we all agree needs to be there. Mm -hmm. you know, so it, there is part of a design integrity copyright piece to this that ensures continuity from start to finish. Great, thanks. And also from Danielle, could you run through what community involvement typically <clears throat> looks like for projects? Sure. Um, it's never typical. <laughs> Um, it's <laughs> different. Yeah, it's specific for each community and because Phoenix is so large and um, has so many different types of communities, we really try to make it specific to where that project is going to be. So it could be that there's a very involved neighborhood association. So we have you go and meet with that neighborhood association before you develop your design. It could be that there's a school nearby and we coordinate a workshop with some students at that school. Um, it's really specific to what the project is and requiring of the artist and what that community needs. Um, at the airport, community engagement is a little different because there are no houses and neighbors. It, your community and your public is going to be the people that utilize the airport. So we'll do a lot of talking with airport staff um, and how they're going to be there every single day um, and trying to understand how they approach travelers. So it's it depends on who the audience is in each project, but there, there will be some type of community or context building work um, in that design process. And we will expand on more of that in next week's session when we walk through design too. Great, thanks. The next question is from Kristen um, and regarding the contract. Are we looking at liability insurance or is there something more? So it is primarily liability insurance. Um, if you go through that section, you'll see that there are some automobile requirements. Um, it, it, it doesn't really. It's, it's very comprehensive, but it is primarily liability to protect you as the artist if anything happens during the project to make sure that you are covered. And from Heather, um, is the contract drafted by Arts and Culture Office and the artist starting with boilerplate, then adding each adding um, their knowledge and expertise of the project? Yeah, so that's the way that this process works. Um, we have a boilerplate that's given to us by our legal department. We go in and customize it for the artist and we work on the um, scope of work and the payment schedule with you as the artist. Then when we have a draft that you as the artist and we as project management are comfortable with, we have to take it back to our legal team. They review it, make sure that they're happy from the city's side from the city legal side then we'll come back to you um, as the artist if there's any changes between then usually there's usually not because we're starting with their boilerplate um, and then we'll bring you in um, to do a sit-down meeting or 
I guess nowadays we will sit down with you via Zoom and we'll walk through each of these closets basically in a very similar fashion to what we did today. Um, we'll walk through those clauses with you and see how it relates back to the scope of work and the payment schedule because um, we want you to feel really comfortable with everything before you sign it. Um, and it is, like I said, it's like a recipe that guides the process going through. I actually keep copies of all of my artist contract in this little drawer right here and I reference them every single day. Um, when I'm looking at what the artists are working on, is it time to pay them? Have they fulfilled all of these requirements? Um, so it's more than just just the agreement that you sign and you put away. I, you know, we actually reference it and use it every single day to guide how we're working through each each project. One thing I can add to that, and is that a lot of the boilerplate stuff has been handed down through years and. And the reason it's there primarily is there are a lot of state requirements for contracts. There are a lot of city requirements, legal requirements for contracts. And quite honestly, most of that stuff is stuff that is not going to change in any kind of negotiation. It's really a, this is the way it has to be. Where there is some flexibility, quite honestly, is in the scope of work, the timing, and then uh, the payment schedule to some degree. And then also from time to time in the indemnification areas or a little bit of tweaking in copyright areas. But most of the contract that you will look at has come down through years of, frankly, negotiations with artists back and forth. And it seems to be the common sense document that works for most broadly uh, for most artists. And uh, so that's where the flexibility is in, in those couple of areas. But a lot of what is in the contract is simply mandated uh, for us as a public agency. That's great, thank you. Because uh, my, uh, I've never done a public art project, um, but it seems like you're a really great safety net for helping somebody uh, through the process and you obviously have a lot of experience. The thing I would I would say to that, and you'll you'll find this as we go forward with these workshops, is that all of the project managers, I mean Katie, Barry, Elizabeth Grahalis, and more recently Doug Holland on our staff, they really are your mentors on how to carry out these projects. Every one of those huge terrazzo projects at the airport, the SkyTrain projects, all of the artists who did those projects had never done anything like that before and really were sort of the training ground for that. And as I said last week, and we'll continue to say that this program and is like this city is that it depends on continually being able to attract new talent. That's what cities do. And so it's important that all of you stay involved, that you apply for projects. It's very competitive field but we're here to help that process and so we're hoping that these workshops sort of shed light on <clears throat> strip away the artichoke you know uh, that can be there on some of these complicated processes okay. that was the end of the questions uh, katie doug suggested earlier that you Give us a little bit of information about your background and why you know so much about contracts. You touched on that a little bit, but you might could expand. Um, so I previously worked for a different city. I worked for the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, um, working in as a, as a public art project manager, contract administrator for a bunch of light rail public art projects. Tons of contracts um, there. It's actually, oddly enough, one of my favorite parts of my job. People are always like, why? But I, I like deciphering and understanding um, and helping artists understand these pieces that are that are a little bit more complicated. So um, we have one minute um, before we're going to close down. So I want to thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, if you have further questions, you have my email where I sent out the login information today. Please feel free to email us there. Um, go and sign up for next week's conversation about design and um, the next Thursday's conversation about fabrication. 
um, and stay posted on our website for Bill's upcoming workshops on how to use Photoshop, Illustrator, and a couple of other softwares. Um, it's going to be really, really helpful um, on the digital side of things. And if you haven't signed up for next week, please do because it's it's really going to be a fascinating walk through step by step of how an artist began with a two dimensional painting that's this big and has turned it into a design for a terrazzo floor, which will be under construction later this month in theory. August uh, 20th is the day that we get to go out and see um, the first uh, um, layout of, of, of Frank's floor. I'm hoping Frank is going to be able to join us for the conversation next Thursday. I've asked him, but haven't heard back yet. So hopefully he can join one us. One of the things that we want to do is feature artists, you know, during the year who have done projects. So you have a chance to sort of ask them questions in the same kind of format about how they rolled with their projects. And quite honestly, if you have ideas for workshops or curiosities you want us to pursue, um, shoot us a note, okay? Because we think that this online workshopping can be really pretty productive uh, during this COVID age. And uh, it offers some opportunities that we hope to be able to help everybody with. There is a As question said, about oh, where to room. sign up. Yeah, there's a question about where to sign up for bills. Um, workshops that hasn't been posted online yet, but they will be posted online and you will be able to find all the information at phoenix.gov front slash arts. Um, so keep an eye out there. That login and sign up information will probably be posted in the next couple of days. Thank you everyone for spending part of your Thursday with us. We really appreciate it. And Katie, thank you very much for organizing this and sharing your expertise on these contracts. And Barry, thanks for keeping track of things. Thanks, we'll see everybody. You week, hope, okay? See you next week. Bye.